Great. So you're all very, very welcome to today's webinar. Um, tips and hints to be more literacy friendly. And this is specifically for the community and voluntary sector. Um, it's just one hour long. I really hope we can just finish up there at 12 o'clock. I know it's a really busy time for everyone. Um, I really, really appreciate you all joining us for this hour. So today I'm going to briefly touch on the current kind of literacy, numeracy and digital literacy needs in Ireland, just to give us a bit of context. Uh, we do have a, a kind of literacy awareness training that we do it's about 60 to 90 minutes but today's I'm really going to try and give you some practical tips um on how to actually um adapt your approach to be more literacy friendly so we'll do a little bit of that uh, context piece then we'll go straight into taking a literacy friendly approach what this kind of means um and then using video as a tool for uh, sharing information raising awareness in a very literacy friendly way We'll also touch on some plain English tips and hints. So plain English for us is communicating very clearly and concisely so that people understand something the first time they read it or the first time they hear it. Um, I just put the point about feedback there as I always forget the feedback survey. Um, it's really important for us to really understand what you need or want for us in terms of the content of these kind of webinars and training. So it'll take two minutes at the end, but I'll share a link with you to just fill out a small feedback survey. Really appreciate it if, if you could take the, the time for that. So just uh, in a nutshell, what NALA does, we support organizations to use a literacy friendly approach and that can be both public, private, and ourselves in the nonprofit community and voluntary sector. Um, we also obviously support adults to improve their reading, writing, everyday maths, and digital literacy. And this is, I suppose, this kind of the nutshell of what we do. We also would do policy, um, research, and advocacy around literacy and numeracy as well. So Literacy has, you know, our understanding of literacy has grown over the years, and it really encompasses so many different aspects of communication. So it's it's reading and understanding text, it's listening and speaking, writing, our everyday numeracy maths, things like working out a discount in a shop, or, you know, going to lunch with a couple of friends and dividing who owes what at the end of a meal. Those are those kind of everyday maths tasks that we need those skills for, our numeracy skills for. Um, technology, obviously, today, we're all very aware of, you know, the need to understand and be able to access and navigate the digital world very much in terms of uh, public services. We've seen a lot of public services coming online and um, requiring people to do applications online, different things like that. Um, and there's also a huge part that we see in um, NALA is confidence and self-esteem. So it's really important that, you know, we understand that when people are nervous or don't feel confident in some of these areas of literacy and numeracy, it really affects their confidence and self-esteem. Um, and so that would generate a lot of maybe hesitation, fear, wariness, um, and maybe people will not take opportunities or will withdraw a little bit because they're nervous about being out in the world where they don't feel um, they have those literacy skills and numeracy skills that they'd like to. So you can see on the right on this illustration, uh, we've just kind of shown some areas of life, both are kind of in our personal individual lives and then out as we interact with the world in terms of uh, society and our communities we live in. We have a uh, democracy in politics. So obviously voting is really important in exercising our democratic right to vote. Um, you know, dealing with our employers, asserting our workplace rights, really important that we, you know, are able to get the information on our rights and exercise them even dealing with your pay slip. It's actually quite a challenging task sometimes trying to figure out how much tax you're paying, the differences between some of the uh, things coming out, maybe your employer's taking things out of your pay slip. Um, so it's just really important that we, we kind of understand the level of, um, I suppose the, the level that we exercise the literacy and numeracy skills every day for so many different tasks. 
Uh, another one that obviously is very clear to us now since we've experiencing this this COVID-19 pandemic is public health information. Always important in times of a, a great emergency, extremely important that people, all people can get access to the information they need. Um, and again, we're seeing this with our increasing weather events becoming more extreme. That also becomes really important that people know where to get information um, and can use it to protect themselves and their families. So we know there are many reasons why someone might, um, you know, as an adult have unmet literacy needs or numeracy needs. Could have been their experience um, at school. You know, many people unfortunately had a very difficult time at school for a variety of different reasons. Um, it could have been because they had an unidentified dyslexia that they didn't get the proper support. It could be because of racism and discrimination in the classroom. It could have been because of abuse, a very wide variety of experiences. Um, and so somebody might have left school without their literacy needs or numeracy needs met. Obviously there's a huge crossover uh, when it comes to um, having those needs met and equality. So for example, if your family is experiencing poverty, if you don't have enough food to eat, if the house you're living in is not warm and comfortable, this is all gonna affect how you um, access education and how you experience education in school. Some people also might've had to leave school early to, to go out and work. Um, and this would have meant that they left maybe with some of these literacy needs unmet. Uh, other people would have, you know, had a, a certain level of literacy and numeracy levels um, and then the digital stuff came in and it really maybe started to overwhelm them and it was just another layer that was a bit challenging for them and this happened in many people's workplaces where we were suddenly expected to be able to navigate this whole new world of digital literacy. Um, and I've just left this slide in. It's a little bit uh, challenging to see, I'd say, on screen, but it just kind of delves in a bit deeper to some of those causes and reasons why some people um, in Ireland today would have unmet literacy, numeracy and digital literacy needs. So I'll leave you, you guys um, to, to go through that maybe afterwards. I'll send all these slides on. So this here is just an example of an assessment for adult literacy. It comes from the program for the International Assessment of Adult Competencies. It's like a crazy acronym, but this is a study that the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, they do um, literacy and numeracy assessments in different countries to, to see what the levels are. Um, and this study was last done in Ireland in 2012. And this is an example of what somebody who was taking part in the study would have a task they would have had to do. So on the left side there, you can see a kind of note on preschool rules. So a note for parents on um, the rules around their child attending preschool. And on the right, you have the question that the person would have had to answer. So what is the latest time children should arrive to preschool? So if you look at the left, I'll give yourselves a few seconds to read that. You might be able to come up with the answer there. So you can see on a notice like this, those of us that are quite comfortable with reading, We'll use our scanning skills. That is, we'll know that we're looking for a time because that's what the question asked us. And so we'll go and we'll scan that note or scan the text to try and find a time, a number. That's our first indication of what we're looking for. And then if we are comfortable uh, to write answers in the chat, thanks guys. Um, if we're comfortable with reading at this in this way, we'll be able to interpret, please have your child here by 9 a.m as that's the latest time a child should attend preschool. So this is a task uh, for reading and comprehension in this study, and it would be what they call a level one. Now, that's not aligned to QQI or anything like that. That's their own study level one. So this, I just wanted to show you an example of this assessment, and it's actually been done right now. So the Central Statistics Office in Ireland, CSO, were actually tasked undertaking this study again this year so they will actually be knocking on people's doors um, and asking people to participate um, in this 
in this study so that we can get new stats, updated stats, and we'd hope to have them by 2024. So I'd really encourage if anybody gets a knock on the door, please do participate. Or if they're looking for somebody, sometimes they will knock on a house and look for a certain age group or things like that to encourage people to, to participate because it's really important. Uh, we have updated stats. So that last study in 2012, we got the statistics in 2013. Um, and it showed quite, you know, quite concerning figures for Ireland. So we saw, we learned that one in six adults would find everyday texts, such as the task I just showed you, or a bus timetable or medical, like um, a dosage on a medicine bottle. People might find it challenging to read and understand that. One in four adults were found to have difficulty with everyday maths. So working out those kind of discounts in a shop or dividing up a bill among friends. And then we know that about four in 10 adults struggle with the basic literacy or sorry, digital literacy tasks, such as looking up a website or sending an email. So what this tells us is this is the reality of who we as community and voluntary organizations are out there speaking to, uh, sharing information, trying to open up services, programs, groups to people where there are one in six who are struggling um, with certain everyday texts. So it's really important that we're aware of this and that we are removing barriers to ensure that people can access everything that we offer, regardless of their unmet literacy, numeracy and digital literacy needs. Of course, we really would be hopeful that the next time round these would be, you know, lower, but we don't know. And so we have to work off these stats for the moment. This is what we know about the current needs in Ireland. Morning. Oh yeah, you well. Did you get new glasses? Yeah. <laughs> so now we're just going to move on straight into using the literacy friendly approach. So like I said, there is a, a longer general literacy awareness training that we do, and we can do that in the future. But today we want to get quite practical. Um, for us, the literacy friendly approach is two things. It's that awareness, you know, being aware that there may be people out there with these needs and taking that into account when you're doing your work and actively removing literacy related barriers. So that is not putting reams of text in front of people, reducing or adapting say intake forms if you have to have them or ensuring there's someone there to help somebody if they need it. Um, and like I said, you saw the stats there, we do it because we know there's a need out there, but we also do it in a general sense across our organizations because we don't really know who understands information or who doesn't you know you know there's a general need out there but unless you have a, a you know a, re a repeated relationship or contact with someone you may never really know who it is in the service that might have that need um literacy is also situational it's about context you know for those of us that are working maybe with marginalized communities we're working with people often at times of stress or crisis um that would also impact someone's literacy um skills as well so you know if you've had a, a diagnosis a medical diagnosis a health diagnosis and you're really really stressed it can be very difficult to take in information and concentrate and focus on reading text and also on what someone's saying if you've ever been in a doctor's appointment or even a, an appointment with the lawyer like it can be quite a stressful situation and it does affect how you take in information so understandably everybody benefits when we all try to provide clear actionable information so this is why many organizations use this universal precautions approach. And I guess this is just meaning that you, you kind of treat everybody that comes through your doors as somebody who is at risk and not understanding the information. So you treat everybody the same in that regard. Um, these are kind of some of the basic things that, you know, you want to do when you're responding to somebody with the literacy needs. Again, with the community and voluntary sector, you're you're always thinking about inclusion you're always thinking about access so it's it's part of the course that you are understanding sensitive and non-judgmental you know um and that you're trying to explain things clearly reassurance is a really important thing um you know we all like to know that we're not the only ones struggling um and if you've ever had to fill out a habitual residency requirement form or any of those social welfare forms you know it's really overwhelming and if someone hands you something that's supposed to be a standard form, you nearly think, God, there's something wrong with me that I'm struggling with this, but it's not, it's really difficult. And I think it's just really useful to be just, you know, just say to someone, 
are you okay filling this out do you want to hand these are really difficult it's you know a lot of people struggle with it just kind of normalizing that it's okay to ask for support and lots of people need it when you are um speaking and giving information um that way it's important that you kind of think about what you're saying before you say it so we're all very busy and often in the community and voluntary sector resource time is like one of the tightest things and so it can be you can be rushing between people and moving between different conversations but it can be really useful to really think about what you're saying to somebody before you say it if you're given information that they have to take action on um so just thinking in my head sometimes you can have a checklist if you give the same information regularly you might have a checklist just to give you a bit of structure so that you stay on on point and stay on what you really have to tell them um there's some other tips there on the screen, um, like, you know, really listening to someone and trying not to finish their sentence. And um, I actually do this a lot in my personal life. It's a really bad habit. Um, but particularly when you're giving information or having a conversation with somebody. Give them the time to think about what they want to say and let them say it how they want to say it and try not to preempt what they're going to say. Um. Open ended questions can be another really useful tool. Um, for example, I could say, do you have any questions for me after I've been, you know, given someone information? A better way to say this is what questions do you have for me? It just implies that you expect questions and that you're there for them and you have that time to hear and answer those questions. It's very easy for someone to say no when you ask, do you have any other questions? So it's just trying to be a bit more um, open-ended um, when you you have that time with someone. Um, another thing that can be quite useful, particularly if you're working with autistic people, finishing the conversation by saying thank you and goodbye. You know, just being clear, this conversation, yeah, it's come to an end. We've done what we need to do here. Thanks a million, goodbye. And it actually just nicely closes off the conversation and gives people that cue. Oh, we're finished here. Of course, in good time and not rushing people out but just to indicate that that's the end of our, our conversation. So that was a bit speedy, Gonzalez. Um, we will be recording this, so you'll be able to watch back and I will give you the slides, but I just wanted to really get into the practical side of things. So video is just, it's a really useful tool um, for giving information, for raising awareness about something and for inviting people to events and groups. Now, this isn't groundbreaking necessarily. You, you might be already using video a lot um, across your organizations, depending on your budgets, whether you have a communications officer or even a communications team. However, you can do video can be done very quickly and very easily, and it doesn't have to go through necessarily the whole communications team. It can be really useful for sharing information and raising awareness uh, in the literacy friendly way it's quite reassuring for someone to see the person that's actually sharing the information. Where is that information coming from? If you're on video, the per, you know, the audience can see you. They, and if they know you even better, because like, oh, that's Jane from the center. Great. What she had to say. So that can be really reassuring because if you're a trusted source of information, it can be really impactful then. Um, and people will really, you know, trust you. Um, of course, there is some element of digital literacy here in, you know, that someone in a household would have to have a smartphone, tablet or laptop in order to access vid most videos. But we do see that um, people are sharing videos or watch this on my phone. You know, the person doesn't necessarily have to have a phone. But yes, of course, there's, there's a cohort of people that won't use um, this technology to be able to access. So I have a couple of videos I'm going to show you now. Um, they're all videos either produced by or in partnership with Pavi Point, the National Traveller and Roma Centre. Um, and Pavi Point have really become really exceptionally good at producing short, clear informational videos. They really um, developed this to a very fine art during the pandemic. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And it became really, really useful. Um, and impactful because they were just so clear and they reached audiences they hadn't reached before. So they would say that they were engaging people that had never engaged in a traveler um, or, or Roma organization or group before. They were kind of on the outer edges and they were watching and engaging with these videos. 
So the first one I'm going to share is from Adapt Domestic Abuse Service. And this video was made to share information with traveler women using the service during the pandemic. Um, it's very short and concise. If you listen carefully, you see how clear everything she's saying. Um, and just listen to how clear the, the, the speaking points are. So I'm just going to stop sharing the slideshow and throw up this video. Adapt Domestic Abuse Services remains open even through the lockdown. There are certain restrictions in place because of COVID-19. Women are been asked not to stay out overnight if they're in the refuge. Families can't mix with other families within the refuge. And if a woman needs to go out, it's for shopping, doctors, courts or guards. These restrictions are in place for all women in the refuge and are in line with public health guidelines. We know these restrictions can be hard for all families, but we're just doing our best to protect everyone and to keep COVID-19 out of the refuge. If you need support, please call 1800 200 504. We're here to listen. Okay, so you can see there, it was a very, very short video. It's 47 seconds, uh, done on a phone. Um, the speaker there is wearing uh, the organization tops. So this is good, a little bit of recognition there. Maybe um, maybe people might know her face from the service. Um, and very clear and concise, straight to the point, did you know explain why the restrictions were important and what the reason was behind them, but did it very quickly and succinctly. Um, so these type of videos are very easy to do uh, on a phone and they can just provide the information in a clear way that is literacy friendly. So, the second video I'm going to share with you is uh, again from Pavi Point, and this is about antigen tests. You keep hearing about antigen tests. What is it? An antigen test is a test you can do at home by yourself, and it can detect the COVID-19 virus. This is different from getting a PCR test by a healthcare professional in a walk-in clinic. The antigen test is quicker than the PCR test as you get the results in about 15 minutes. But antigen tests are not as accurate as PCR tests. That's why it's really important to book a PCR test straight away if you have symptoms of the virus, however mild they are. You can buy these antigen tests in a lot of different places. You can get one test or you can get multi-packs if you need to test your family. These are for sale in your local chemist, supermarket and shops. There are a lot of different brands, but make sure whatever one you're buying has the CE mark on it. So again, just straight to the point video, there was clear, you know, he was clearly using a script there but it was actually quite good. Like you used the emphasis on the right places. So it was it was easy to understand. And it, it, I think the beauty of it is as well, you can see the context there done on a phone in somebody's kitchen, you know, really relaxed, relatable environment for somebody. And again, somebody they know or somebody they can relate to. It doesn't have to be flashy, glossy, edited, you know, professionally or anything like that. And um, these videos as well, they could be shared Um you know, just to your audience, as in you can make the link private on YouTube and just send it to the people that need to see it. It doesn't need to be public, you know, if you're not comfortable with that. Um, but it can be used in whichever way is useful for your organization. So I'm going to show you one more. And this is, so the last two were very much about giving information. These next two are about raising awareness. People who drink alcohol and use drugs as an excuse for being violent and abusive towards women and girls. The cause of domestic violence is one person abusing their power to control another person. Some people choose to drink alcohol and use drugs and choose not to be violent or abusive towards women and girls. It's your choice. Listen carefully. Domestic violence is never okay. So 
again, another very simple video in a domestic, you know, context there, somebody sitting at home with a, a phone, but because it's the person there is speaking to their own community about an issue, it's very, very impactful. And those videos were really, they saw a huge amount of engagement. Um, so the very, very last one, it's a little bit of a fancier one. So if, if your editing skills get up a little bit higher, uh, but it's more for me, the message, the speaker and the message uh, that really drives the point home. And again, a very literacy friendly way. When I walked in together, they were very pleasant people. And she come over and told me where to sit and she got me the injection. In fact, it didn't hurt at all. It's just like getting a flu needle for the, for the flu. Yeah, a bit sore here, but he expect that after injection. But I'm lying to my mouth. I'm fine. And there's some of the worry took away from there. <laughs> but I did hear a lot about it before I got it. That it can do this or do that and you'll get the, not as bad for you. But I didn't believe when I heard the Pope getting it, I got it. Because they're not going to kill the Pope, are they? <laughs> I really wanted to get it because I was so nervous of the virus. I'm in that uh, house for about four months or five months now. And I men is desperate to be inside. No one coming into you, you're not going out and you have no one to talk to. And uh, I couldn't wait for it, to be honest. At least I can come outside the door and chat people at the wall. <laughs> I was so nervous I wouldn't even come to the wall. I listened to the six o'clock news and the nine o'clock news. And I listened very carefully, no one was going on about it. <laughs> and you have to trust people. And I'd advise anyone that's nervous or afraid, Matt, if they are or not, they should go and get it. So again, another example there, very short video. Now I will admit there was a little bit of editing there and different locations filmed. So obviously that might be a bit of a reach for somebody starting out with videos. But the conversational nature of it, you know, Nelly was very good at expressing the realities, reassuring people. That's going to have more impact than a flyer ever will, a video like that, you know. Um, and especially if she is familiar to people and people um, trust her judgment on things. I'm just going to get my slides back. So that was providing information and raising awareness, those last two videos, the first one about domestic violence, the second one about getting vaccinations uh, for COVID-19. The third um, useful uh, way to use video is to invite people to events or groups. Um, and this can be really short videos, very uh, quickly done on your phone, on selfie mode, on your video camera. Um, we recently had a great speaker, uh, Maria, who is a homeschool um, community liaison officer in Warren Mount Primary in Dublin 8. And she has used this in the past to engage parents where there may be an unmet literacy need, where the, but there, there's definitely a language need. So English would be people's second language. And she has used video to invite them to things. Um, and again, this video wouldn't be necessarily publicly displayed. It would be sent individually to people. Um, and so in this video, if you're inviting someone to an event or you're starting a new group, so say, for example, there's a new program starting and you're looking for, you know, parents of children in sixth class or something like that. Just clearly do it in 30 seconds. Say who you are and the organization or the community and voluntary organization you're coming from. The name and title of the program or event, the days and times, the practical information up front is really important. What it is, what's going to happen, uh, what's in it for people is always important. So people need to know what's in it for them. What's the benefit? Um how to join up or sign up, and then a phone number and a contact name um, for further information. That can be done really quickly. Um, and Maria, this homeschool community liaison officer, found it a very effective way for engaging people um, and getting them to respond and to attend different events and groups. So it's a third way uh, the video can be used um, to get that information out there in a literacy friendly way. So the basics that you need are a phone, a smartphone, maybe a tripod, and that's just that um, that three-legged little plastic thing. You can buy them really cheaply, and that's just to keep the phone steady. You don't necessarily need it. You can prop it up against a book, uh, but it could be handy, and it's pretty cheap to get. Daylight is, is really useful because light can be a bit challenging on camera, um, and making sure you know it's not um, throwing off your face and you're only seeing the background and not seeing the person's face uh, but from the side of a window can give you some nice natural light 
very simple talking points and script. You could see there in some of the videos, people were clearly reading from a script. But as long as you um, remember to look into the camera lens as much as possible and to emphasize things so you're not like too robotic, um, a script is fine. It depends on how comfortable you are. Otherwise, talking points can be a bit more casual, informal, conversational style. Person, I bit tongue in cheek here, but it is important that we don't come across too robotic or um, formal. You know, you need to, to communicate with people as if you would be if they were in the room with you, which is hard to do when there's a camera in your face. But it is important to kind of try to be quite warm um, when you're speaking. A little bit of practice obviously goes a long way, uh, but don't it doesn't have to be perfect. And I think that's what's really important with videos. When you see a lot of organizations coming out really fancy, edited, flash, put a lot of money behind it, it can be a bit intimidating. It doesn't need to be that way. And actually, they found on social media, some of the more informal, less professional ones, people respond to more because it feels more authentic. So don't be overly concerned with being so everything being very perfect. And lastly, the best indicator if it's working or if it's useful for you is if you ask the people you're trying to communicate with, do one or two and ask for feedback on them. Find out what's going on or if people actually prefer this way of receiving information or they'd rather, you know, a flyer, they'll let you know what's useful for them. So two apps that you're all probably using, WhatsApp and Zoom, are really handy um, for doing videos. Um, and giving people literacy friendly information. So WhatsApp, and many people are using this already across different organizations. You've got video messages, voice notes, and photos. Um, all three can be very useful for um, sharing information in a literacy friendly way. A uh, video message, obviously, like we just said, it could be a quick video message directly to one person. You know, it might be the easiest way to communicate with the person you're working with. A voice note in the same way. Photographs can be very useful. For example, I was speaking to an organization that help um, people in immigration, different immigration applications, and they take pictures of the type of documents that people need to bring back into them. So even if that person might, you know, struggle to read or read English, they'll be able to see the format of the document and maybe a couple of colors, say if it was like a utility bill, they see the electric Ireland symbol from the photograph they're being sent and they go, oh, do I have something like this at home that I can bring in? So images, as simple as it sounds, it can be really effective um, in, for supporting people who might have a literacy need. Some of you may know this well already, WhatsApp has a function called broadcast. And this means um, that you can broadcast, send basically the same message separate to multiple contacts. So I think we're all fatigued by the group chat where we're all in the same group and all the messages go into that group. So we see everything. Whereas if you use broadcast, you can prepare the same message or video message and send it to up to 256 contacts separately. Uh, this is really handy if for you know privacy reasons, you don't want everybody in the same group chat. Um, and if you want to be able to track what everyone's saying, it's much easier when it's a back and forth between two people than in a whole group chat. Uh, so it can be quite efficient if you're working with people in a group to be like, oh, I'm going to send broadcast, send this message to 10, 15 people rather than uh, setting up a group. Zoom, it actually it's useful because obviously we're recording right now. You can record videos on your laptop. What I've used this in the past for is screen sharing. So if I want to record a quick how to do something like fill out an online form or something, I can go on, start a call with myself, basically, press record, share my screen and talk through it. And then you, those videos will, um, those recordings will, will save onto your, either your computer or onto the cloud. Um, and then you can use them to send to other people. So it can be quite useful for that. Uh, this is just to show you where in WhatsApp you can find that broadcast in case you haven't used it before. So this is when you open WhatsApp, you see the three dots in the right hand corner. Um, and then down there, the after group is broadcast. And when you click that, it asks you to select the contacts. And you can do that on the free version of WhatsApp for up to 256. So it's just a, it's a, it can be a really handy tool. OK, so that was video. And now we're going to move swiftly on to using plain English. So like I mentioned before, this is a style of presenting information so that someone can understand it the first time they read or hear it. 
Um, and, you know, our number one rule when it comes to using plain English or plain language is just putting your audience first. Um, what is it they really need to know and what kind of language do they use day to day? Again, um, you know, kind of the rationale for why to use plain English. Um, obviously, the thing that we're most concerned about that most people and more people can access our information and services, um, that people understand things at a deeper level. Um, that we have fewer mistakes and fewer questions. So for example, if I am talking to somebody and they're very clear the next three documents, for example, if I'm doing casework that they have to bring back to me, they come back the next time with those three documents, we can move on, progress that application. If they come back several times with the wrong documents, it's prolonged for them. They're not getting the service or the thing they need as quickly as possible. And obviously that takes away time that we could be helping somebody else. Um, so it's it's good for for many reasons. So we're, there's a couple of top tips I have here. Um, again, what I mentioned there, right for your audience. So you know the people that use um your services or programs or to get information from you. Um, and it's a you're speaking to them. So it's really important to use the languages, phrases, everyday language that people are using. Um, everyday words. This is really important for those of us that can end up being pulled into, I don't know, insider kind of jargon filled policy conversations, or if we're all talking around the table with our colleagues, we're throwing acronyms around the place and we're using all this insider language that maybe average member of the public wouldn't have knowledge of. Um, so in our writing and design tips booklet, and I'll send you a link to this, we have um, a great list of words, alternative words, um, everyday words for things that sometimes pop up in documents um, and definitely in, in policy things. You can see on the left that these are the, the, the words that we want to replace. And on the right, we have the alternative version. So in the event that can be just replaced with if. And sometimes it's the most simplest things that are hardest to find in your head when you're rushing around doing all your documents. Um, it would appear that can be replaced with apparently. Uh, make an application. You can just use apply. So we have this um this booklet and thanks a million Eva for sharing it there in the chat where you can find a whole list of words like this and you can just check with yourself. Am I using the most everyday word I could be using? Go back. So the third uh, tip here is to be personal. And um, what we mean by that is, you know, when you're talking about your organization, sometimes we overuse the name. So, for example, the National Adult Literacy Agency. So NALA is an organization that supports adults to improve their reading and writing. The next sentence, change to we. We also provide training. You know, you don't have to repeat the organizational name because that can be quite formal. If you use we, it can be quite, um, it can be seem that the person is closer to you. And then when you use you, um, if you're talking directly to your audience, use you. And um, you can get information, you know, be very direct um, and personal. It's, it's much more, um, it, it brings a connection with your reader that's much closer. And they'll be like, oh, they're talking to me. I can understand this. This is for me. Um, point number four there, keep sentences short. So we would say a general rule of thumb there, you know, these are all just guidelines, but is to keep sentence to 15, 20 words maximum. It just gets very uncomfortable for reading if things get a bit longer. Um, so that would be kind of our guideline is 15 to 20 words. Spell out acronyms. I think most people do this by, um, by now, but, you know, the first time you use an acronym, spell it out. Uh, and then you can use the acronym thereafter. If you have a very long document and there's different sections or chapters, you might want to spell out the acronym at the start of each one of those, just to remind people of what it means. Number six, be consistent. Um, so this is something uh, that can happen to many of us. Basically, to avoid confusing your reader, you should use the same term for the same concept throughout a document. So for example, if you're calling people service users, don't switch up halfway through and call them community members. Continue to use the same term throughout. Otherwise, people, a reader might get confused and think you're talking about different groups. So just be consistent as possible when it comes to those kind of terms. Uh, seven is about using the active voice. 
Um, so when we talk about the active voice, you will see an examples here on the left side. If you look at the very last one, we will decide on your application soon. That would be active. So we, the subject, comes first, then the verb, then the object. On the right, you'll see a passive um, structure here. A decision on your application will be made soon. So it's much easier for a reader to have the, the subject come first and then the verb. It's more direct and we kind of understand where everything stands because we know who's doing the action. So we will decide in your application soon is far better than a decision on your application will be made soon. It's disconnected from, uh, from the subject um, and it's just much clearer, the active voice in this scenario. It's not to say you should never use the passive voice, but where possible, the active voice can really um, be much clearer for a reader. Um, number eight here, our, our tips is to use signposts. So if you are writing something, it's important to use signposts like headings, bullet points. If it's a longer document, table of contacts. Um, these all help people to kind of see, oh, which bit am I reading now? Where are my folks? What is this about? It just really helps us to follow something. Um, and it just gets our brain into gear for what we're about to read. So signposting is really useful. So part of the, the plain English piece is also about format. So it's not just about content, but also about format. So here's some just formatting tips, some general formatting tips. Uh, we recommend not to use all capitals. It's a bit shouty. So from a tone, tone point of view, it's not great, but actually the, it is actually easier to read lowercase letters. So they're more distinct from each other. At capitals, it can be difficult to distinguish some letters from each other. We recommend line spacing of at least 1.5 and um, always trying to line to the left side um, and use bold for emphasis. So we would recommend to avoid using italics. Italics can be very difficult to read. So if you want to highlight an important uh, you know, word or a piece of information, we'd recommend using just bold or color. Color can be used, but sparingly. Um, we recommend as well sans serif fonts like Arial. Uh, so something that does, it's quite simple, uh, it's clean lines, doesn't have a lot of extra tails and things off the letters. Um, again, at least we'd recommend font size 12. And we've already mentioned that spelling out and defining acronyms so people can understand what it is you're talking about. So, we just have a quick example here of plain English in practice. So this is a notice of some computer room rules. And you'll see here a few bullet points, which is good, but there are a couple of different problems. Um, you'll probably see straight away, there's a lot of italics there in that first block of text. Um, the font itself wouldn't be very clear. And there's a use of a fairly um, large amount of use of like the passive voice and overly complicated um, language. So that's our before. I'll give you a, a few seconds to read that. And now you can see an after version. So this is after it's been edited for plain English.
So straight away, even before you start trying to read the, the text, you can see straight away it feels a little bit more welcoming, a little bit clearer. Um, there's less text because there was a lot of unnecessary uh, language in there. Um, and then the bold itself, because sometimes it is hard to let go of at italics or different ways of emphasizing if, you, if you've used it for a long time, but you can see it's very effective to just use bold. Um, and here the heading is, is in a color text, but the rest is just black. Absolutely, yeah, a active voice is much clearer there. Um, sometimes you can feel maybe you want to balance between the active voice or it might sound a bit demanding, but the reality is you want people to understand what it is they have to do and that's what they want. Do you know what I mean? So there's a place and time sometimes for a bit of extra language, um, but when it comes to classroom rules or, or things that are just, you ju they just need to know what they have to do or what they don't have to do. Um, be direct you know that's what people need um and it's much clearer than for everybody about what the expectations and responsibilities are so now um i say we have a few minutes we've just there at 10 to 12 um and i just wanted to 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 i suppose ask a few questions here I think maybe we'll just do it because there's not too too many of us here it's about um 22 people on the call so feel comfortable if you want to go on the mic if you could put your hand up or um you can also participate in the chat but I'm just looking um and interested I suppose mostly in um question two and three because I I would imagine you're interested or you're here because you have come across I believe you will come across people with male literacy and numeracy and digital literacy needs so if anyone had any examples that you'd like to share because I think people really learn from each other here um in terms of adapting your approach and if you've heard anything today that you think you might you might learn um so I think we have a hand up there Isa if you want to say something Isa Lane Sorry, hi. Hi, yeah. Uh, I'm Isha. I'm a guidance counsellor, um, and I've been working in guidance for over twenty years. Now, having said that, in one of my many previous lives, I did train and work very briefly as an adult literacy tutor. But I'm here more in a professional capacity. This is something I have a huge interest in, and not just for the purposes of people with literacy, because I find as well a lot of the guidelines we get from the likes of yourselves are also useful. For example, for people maybe with visual impairment. You know, it can be easier for them to physically read a text. Um, and also, and again, another former life, I was a teacher of English as a foreign language. So even for people for whom English is not their first language, again, the simpler, plainer English makes that. So I think it, it's, it, it helps more than just people with the obvious literacy deficiency. So, I mean, I would say that in the first instance. Um, and as you can imagine, I've worked almost exclusively with adults as a guidance counselor. So I would have met many people over the years who, have unmet needs for a variety of reasons, many of which you mentioned at the start, had to leave school early, undiagnosed dyslexia, you know, I won't even start. So that's why, you know, I'm always trying to do little bits and pieces like this because I, I myself, I was looking at what you were saying about the plain English and I was like, oh, that's me. I use these very long winded words and I don't mean to. It's just often the first thing that comes into my head is the longer word, maybe too much university or university writing or something. I don't know. And um, so I think it's good for me to be reminded of getting back to some of the more basics, you know, that I need to remember myself. So, um, and also, could I just ask, as I have you, I have a bit of a bugbear about nowadays where, for example, Nala, when I was going to school, we would have been taught to spell that N full stop, A full stop, L mm -hmm. full stop, A full stop. In other words, shows people that it's actually an acronym and not a word. And I have a brief bugbear that these aren't used. So I'm wondering where you stand on that. You obviously don't use it there, but I have actually misread things myself. I read an acronym thinking it was a word or a name. So I think it's very, I think it's confusing. Mm. And I do think they should bring back the full stop, but hey, you know, <laughs> that's just my own opinion anyway, or that's my own. I'm just interested to hear your particular opinion on that because we use so many acronyms, you know. That's a I'll very good talking. question. No, but and thanks so much for sharing that experience. And I think it's really important what you say. So like if you've done um you have experience even writing in plain English for a while, or you know, you've you've you maybe worked in that literacy world, 
you know, it's always about, it's a continuous job, I think, to, to check in with and reflect on how you communicate, you know, and I think, yes, it's absolutely maybe to do what you're doing, a piece of work that requires a higher, like, you know, a more complex language, and then sometimes hard to switch back. Or sometimes it's, um, it's just time, you're just a bit running around the place. And so when you're speaking, maybe you're not thinking as much beforehand and things like that. So I, I agree, we all need to check in with this. Great question about the acronym. Um, I have to say, I'm not sure. Um, if I don't know, our communications officer is here with, if I don't know if you have any. No, I'm not 100% sure. That. Like what we would say anyway, as long as you're using it, if you're using acronyms and you're using the dots, be consistent with how you use it. Like I suppose for us, NALA is a name. So we want people to be able to read it as a word, not N-A-L-A. -A. Um, and I know some organizations do spell out their name as the letters. Um, but I'm actually not sure, hundred percent sure when that decision would have been made. It's a bit mm. of before our time, I think. Yeah, um, but well, again, as long as you're consistent, you, it's not just you; it's everywhere now. And I think, yeah. with the advent of computers, I think it came in with computers. Myself, Could be. yeah, yeah computer. I'm I'm that old that I'm sort of pre-computer, you know. Um, but it's just I, I know myself. I remember I've read things, and I thought, especially if everything was in block capitals, and mm. I just read the, the block capitals as another name or a mm. word and it was actually OBE yeah. and not O. Yes. Yeah. You know. Yeah. No, it is a good point. And and again, these things do change over time. And yeah. somebody that is familiar with one way of doing it and it changes. And I'd say you might be onto something there in terms of the digital that it might be perceived as something else. Um so yeah, no, I'm gonna follow that up, Issa, though, because it is interesting. Um and I I do remember myself those the dots <laughs> obviously being used as a standard. Yeah. That me has no, changed. I mean, it, I mean it, it's fine. I think if you're writing something and you spell it out, that's fair enough, because I would do that anyway. It's just that sometimes if people use acronyms and other people might realize it's an acronym and they yeah. might just think this is a word. Yeah. And it's just so that people realize it's an acronym. Yeah. By all means, saying something NALA is a lot easier than saying N-A-L-A. -A. So yes. it's just yeah. once people, when it's written, the people realize it is an acronym and it's not an actual word. Absolutely. Well, you know what I mean? I'm, yeah, I'm being very on plain English here now. <laughs> <That's over. laughs> and we have two more questions there from Maeve, if you want to go ahead. Hi, guys. Thanks very much. That was a really good presentation. Um, so my background is nursing and um, come, a lot, come across this very much in my current job where I'm working on the telephone helpline and guidance and support. This was one thing that you have touched there, but is the digital literacy and we have managed to help people who can't read and write do some of our programs and courses through videos. Those little videos, those short films, like they have just transformed people's lives. And I suppose we, we're lucky enough in our organization to be have made kind of tablets individually aware, uh, available for them. Okay. There's one tablet that's very user friendly. Is it Acorn? for older people, for people with um, special needs or literacy. So, you know, our videos, our guidance of what we do from an exercise, from talks perspective. So that has kind of really helped us. And that's why I wanted to do this is so that we're given the short, brief messages that aren't complicated. So, you know, just showing those two pieces of, of text and a different um, view of them, you know, I, I, I'm not great on loads of text. I can't bear it, but you know, my brain just gets too busy. So that, that's just our findings of it. And I suppose, you know, my, 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 my part is today is people love bits of paper. They love the booklets, they love the information, but um, you know, like I'm always pitching it at to, um, between eight and 12, that if you can read it between eight and 12, I don't know whether that's right. I don't know whether it's wrong. It's something that was always in my head from my student nurse days. And um, so, yeah, that's that's kind of my my my, my experience. Great. Th thanks, Amelia, mate. That's really interesting to hear. Um, and yeah, it, it is interesting because, of course, there's the digital divide and it can be challenging for people with literacy needs, but it also has opened up a whole lot of um, opportunity for communicating yeah. in more accessible right. ways. It's great. And the Alo Alone and the um, local library yeah. are making them so available. So yeah. it is great. So thank you very much. Thanks, Amelia, mate, for sharing that with us. Um, Fiona, I think you were, you were next there. 
Hi, just to, make, just to make a point, I work for ILMI, sorry, in an acronym, and <laughs> Independent Living Movement Ireland, and it's a mouthful, so, and it took me like a year to learn ILMI just to roll off the tongue, so it can be hard, but like, um, be aware, I, I'm sure now is, is aware that under the public sector duty, um, all public bodies must make their information accessible, um, yeah. including easy to read, plain English and video, and and then um, real if required. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and I think I definitely see from our um, plain English editing and training kind of department that we're getting mm -hmm. a lot of public sector organizations reaching out and looking for that training and really trying to make a big effort. Um, so it's definitely, I think it was um, in the last program for government, there was a commitment as well to, to it across the public sector in terms of plain language. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a ways to go, <laughs> but it there's definitely more of a... Um, an awareness of it and to be honest in some circles they need to know that it's effect it'll make their job easier <laughs> and and I think that's becoming more clear people are seeing actually this is really beneficial for lots of reasons um but yeah if you on a really good point about the public sector duty and that people are aware of that and if they come across or as a community involuntary sector if you're coming across somebody who's had a barrier there who hasn't been able to access information for whatever reason uh you know that can be you know made a complaint about under that public sector duty and people can raise that issue uh, so thank, thanks for sharing that Fiona it's really important to remind us um Mary there I think has a question um yeah hi um hi. I actually have a question in relation to I actually have a document that I need to um try and make um easier to read for people who would have um, um neuro uh, neurological conditions um, and my concern is if I put it in easy to read or plain English, I'm afraid I'm going to lose important information. So how do I guard against that? That's difficult. And I guess every, you know, and I know that our, um, our plain English editing service, they would, you know, that's a negotiation if they have to take on a job with somebody about you know, and if you have your red lines of what you have to say, that that's okay. What we maybe would say suggesting that is putting the very, very need to know information at the top mm -hmm. and then allowing for further information, sorry, further information um, under headings. You know, it's the way it's laid out. So if there's something that you have to, to, to keep in the document, it's definitely putting the very prioritized information at the very top. And then further information under headings, or if it's on a website, clicking through in, into further information on a page. Um, if you're talking about technical terms, like if there's language in it that you need to use, but it's quite technical, a glossary can be a useful okay. um, thing to use. Um, we know uh, the HSC has actually done exceptional work on this. Um, there's a few things I can send on to you um, in terms of their FAQs. Um, and they have an E to uh, was it E for, I think it's A to Z of eight of of um kind of medical terms. Uh, it was really helpful. Uh, so I might pass that on to you, Mary, and that might help That'd be you. Great. Yeah, thanks, but, but you know, there, of course, there's that you have to negotiate between uh, the information that has to be given and maybe some of the language used and making it easy to read or plain English. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just sometimes it's the way you lay it out and including glass where you can just give a bit of extra support to people. But it's okay I, for to... Uh, sorry, Mary, I would <laughs> also like test it out, you know, yeah. so always give it to someone, I give it to a few people um, and test it out. It's never going to be perfect. Okay. As well. <laughs> That's a great yeah, tip, Fiona. Yeah, <laughs> it's because it's it's currently two pages, and I'm afraid if I make it easy to read or plain English, I'm afraid it's going to be like eight pages, and I I also don't want to lose people by handing them eight pages as opposed to two pages. But yeah, okay, that's brilliant. Thanks, Mary and Fiona. Thanks, Mary and Derek. No worries. And like Fiona said, to be honest, that that's <laughs> that's a good rule of thumb for anything. Check in with your audience. Um, yeah. you know. 
and that goes for us all like we can do things in our own little silo for a while and then put them out in the world and realize oh we should have done this <laughs> earlier because it's so far gone then do you know what I mean um so that is it that's a really great tip from Fiona I am um, we just have one last question there in the chat from Adele about icons and images for raising awareness posters we use them um so we would use for example um so this is kind of a different from an awareness poster, but in our workbooks, say, for example, if there's a writing exercise, we'd use the pen uh, symbol if there's speaking, listing. Uh, but we would, yeah, icons can be very useful because they can trigger that association. Uh, oh, they're talking about this or that. Um, it's probably best never to overwhelm something. So sometimes you'd have a flyer or a poster and there's just too much going on in terms of symbols or pictures or whatever. So clean look is important. Lots of white space so people can concentrate and and uh, take something in. But yeah, there's definitely a place uh, for images and icons. Definitely. Um. OK, so we're just finished now at 12 o'clock. I will pass on um further information the slides and a couple of the guides that we use um and I'll, I'll i'll pass on that a to z hse uh guide as well for you all um if you want to do general literacy awareness or you think your organization or group could benefit do let us know we're um we can schedule in for next year um and keep an eye on all of um our events pages and things like that on our website for for upcoming events our plain English editing and training service is a paid for service at the moment when it's tailored for you specifically and goes into your documents. But I am pushing um, them to offer a few freebies for the nonprofit sector. So hopefully we'll have a few sessions next year where you can get that. Um, so thank you so much and happy Christmas. Thank you so much. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. All right. Bye. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much.